Welcome to my podcast. Today's guest is Eva Yablonka. She's an Emma Writers Professor at Tel Aviv University and perhaps best known as an evolutionary theorist and geneticist who has defended the idea of epigenetic inheritance. Um, what this means, we'll explain shortly. However, she's also a philosopher and historian of science with a deep interest in the history of biological thought. In her more recent work, Jablonka has, together with Simona Ginsberg, written a lot about animal consciousness and its evolution. And she's written an influential book called The Evolution of the Sensitive Soul on the evolutionary origins of consciousness. Now, influential also on me, since I myself wrote a PhD thesis on Darwinian approaches to consciousness, which was influenced a lot by her work next to other Darwinian thinkers such as Dan Dennett, who I interviewed a few weeks ago. So it's great to have Eva here today. Um, welcome. Thank you very much, Walter, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to see you. Yeah, so we saw each other a couple of months ago, um, earlier this year, where we were both honored to meet <laughs> the Dalai Lama in India. That was quite spectacular. Yeah. How was it for you to uh, to have this privilege to meet the Dalai Lama? Well, you know, I was very, very, very happy, very happy for about this occasion, and I was very much looking forward to it, and it was very, very interesting. You know, I don't. We didn't see him for very long, and we didn't. It was only an hour and a half that we had with him, actually, and we didn't have an opportunity to really discuss things in depth mm. with him. But it was uh, very, very nice to see him, and uh, I was very interested to hear the uh, Buddhist scholars mm. who did participate in our conference on animal consciousness in uh, Dharmasala. And uh, I think uh, it was, although their, uh, kind, th their approach is not one I share, I found that I learned a lot from them and from the questions and from the informal interactions that I had with them. And uh, also somehow I think that the atmosphere in this conference was very, was probably somewhat uh, influenced by their attitude to each other and to us and to to ideas it was on the one hand a very kind of um, a sharp and focused intellectual uh, discussion but on the other hand there was quite a lot of tolerance and quite a lot of listening which is quite rare mm, yeah in uh, in uh, in many in many such on many such occasions so it was it was very interesting and they were very good people there so it was a pleasure yeah i think the monks were extremely friendly it was a very quite uh special to get to talk to them you wouldn't meet them at any conferences usually right Yes, I think it was not just friendly. They were friendly in a kind of, uh, they really wanted to understand hmm. your position, even though they did not agree with me, for example. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, they obviously didn't agree with me, but they did want to understand how I'm thinking and why I'm thinking in, this, hmm. in the way that I'm thinking and so on. And so did I. I wanted to understand how they are thinking. So before I came there, I did my homework and I read a lot of this, uh, you know, so the Dala, what the Dalai Lama wrote and what this, uh, the books they have published about uh, uh, the Tibetan, Tibetan Buddhism. So it was very interesting for me. Yeah, they were very well read. Uh, one of the monks told me they read Richard Dawkins and they they agreed with one of his sentences that um if they had been born, say, into a different country, they'd probably have a different religion. That was interesting to hear how, yeah, they had this really broad outlook and wanted to learn uh, a lot, right? Yes, I think, you know, the, uh, from what I understand, the Dalai Lama is sending some of them to universities in the United mm. States to in order to study science. So, and that's very good. Mm. Yeah, before we... Uh, continue to talk more about consciousness i think we should go a bit chronological now you're very much known for your work on epigenetics could you explain what this means ah okay so 
basically uh, epigenetics is a term that was coined by uh, uh, Waddington, Conrad Waddington. In, in the end of the 1930s, he started talking about it, but in 1947, there is a definition. And basically, it is the network of interactions between genes and their products that, that bring the phenotype into being. This is how he uh, defined it. So he defined it in terms of networks of interactions and all kind, and these networks involve all kinds of feedbacks that on the one hand lead to extreme canalization of development. So development is very, very buffered in spite of the fact that there are a lot of variations, genetic variations, as well as environmental variations. Development tends to be channeled and buffered and that interested him very, very much. And he thought that this was one of the key things one has to understand about development. And on the other hand, and compatible with it and necessary for it is plasticity, the ability to respond in many different ways to the same stimulus and develop different phenotypes at different levels. And the reason that this is the two things are, are necessary for each other is if you have to have canalization at the level of the uh, phenotype, for example, if you have, uh, if, if you need to, for example, keep uh, body temperature constant, in order to do that, you have to make a lot of plastic responses to change mm. conditions in the environment. So in order to have canalization, you need plasticity. So, and this is what Waddington was very interested in. He was very interested in this aspect, this decoupling between the genetic and phenotypic uh, aspects of development. Because there is a decoupling, because if you have canalization, you can have a lot of variation at the genetic level, which is not expressed at the phenotypic level. And the same with plasticity, you can have a lot of phenotypic variation that is not related to variation at the genetic level. And he was very interested in this decap. However, Waddington was not interested in the inheritance of uh, phenotypes, hmm. which, are, which are independent of DNA variations. He, uh, this was not part of his view. He talked about cultural inheritance into, uh, as, as an inheritance systems ba basically, but he didn't think, and he said it explicitly, that, that in other, uh, that in non-human animals or in non-human organisms, there is uh, inheritance of, uh, which is independent of uh, DNA variations. However, during the, uh, the, the uh, during the beginning in the 1970s and then in the 1980s and, uh, and then, and afterwards, uh, this kind of research developed even more, there was a lot of uh, there were a lot of studies that showed that there is uh, that there must be inheritance systems that are superimposed on DNA variations and can be independent on, on, uh, of variations at the at the level of the DNA sequence. So, if you're thinking, for example, about development, and you, if you're thinking about cell heredity, mm -hmm. about the heredity of, uh, uh, for example, if you're thinking about determined uh, liver cells and determined uh, kidney cells. They are different from each other, although the DNA in the same organism is exactly the same. They are different. The gene expression patterns are very, very different and they breed true as these cells multiply. So there is an inheritance, a cell cellular inheritance, cell heredity during development. Now, this was quite well known in the, and people wrote about it in the 1950s, for example. However, what was not, uh, what was thought not to exist was the idea that this kind of cell, of this, this kind of inheritance system, developmental kind of inheritance system, can operate also between organisms, that it can be transmitted from one generation to the next of organisms. However, as I said, in, in, but in the beginning, in the, 80s people started thinking in these terms. I started thinking in these terms, mm. for example, uh, in the early 80s, I must say. Me and um, I, when I say I, this work was done with Marion Lamb, 
Mm-hmm. So we really thought about it together and worked on it together. And I can tell you more about it if you're interested. It's quite an interesting story. Uh, anyway, we realized, it was realized not only by us, there were very, very, f- the, there were few experiments at the molecular level. Uh, the, it was realized that it, it could happen and that there are actually, the mechanism that we began to understand at the developmental level within organisms can operate also between organisms. So there are mechanisms that allow the inheritance of random and uh, blind and acquired induced developmental variations from one generation to the next. And this is called epigenetic inheritance. And epigenetic inheritance is part of epigenetics. So epigenetics was a little bit from the very broad kind of uh, definition that Waddington suggested, it was slightly narrowed into thinking about the uh, inher- about the development, the develop the, uh, the the developmental kind of mechanism that leads to stability uh, within w- within the organism during the development during the autogeny of the organism and between organisms that can lead to inheritance. And this inheritance is what we call epigenetic inheritance. It is mm-hmm. inheritance of variations that are independent of variations in DNA base sequence. Could you tell us although about... They, although they can impinge, yeah. they can influence the DNA. Mm. Could you tell us about your um, academic education and how you ended up collaborating with Marion Lamb? Uh, yes, it, uh, it's a very funny kind of... Uh, I mean, I when I was very young, I was interested in literature and philosophy. Mm-hmm. I read a lot of philosophy and I read a lot of literature. Nobody in his, who knew me at that time would, uh, and including myself, uh, would uh, imagine hmm. that I, I would end up being a scientist. And uh, what happened was that uh, I lived uh, where uh, the place where I lived was not far from the university. It was in Tel Aviv. It was a new university. And uh, that was established near the place in which I lived. I came, mm. When we came there, there was no university, but it was built later on. And I went to, to and I went, to, and it was, at that time, it was very easy for anybody to go and le- listen to lectures. You didn't have to show any, any documents or anything. You just went. So I went and listened to it when I was uh, an adolescent. I went and listened Mm. uh, in the university to a lot of lectures in in philosophy uh, and in literature. And uh, I was, like many adolescents, a little bit arrogant, uh, intellectually arrogant, because I did read a lot. And uh, and I thought, well, this kind of stuff that they're teaching, I can can study it myself. (laughs) I can read it. I I I, I read most of the stuff, actually. So I, but I did realize that I don't know anything about the world. And if I want to be really a writer and a philosopher who writes a writer, a philosophical kind of writer or a, <laughs> or a philosopher who, who writes in a way that is, you know, that, that has some kind of literary value to it, then I must know something about the world. So. I started reading uh, popular science, and the popular science I started reading was George Gamow on cosmology. And I got very fascinated by it, because he was talking about uh, the birth of the universe and the solar system, and about uh, white dwarfs and red giants, and about cosmology, about the great story of the evolution of the of the universe and I thought well that, that's really this is what I would like to study but then just then I read two books that changed my mind the first book that I read was uh, Arthur Kessler uh, the ghost in the machine hmm. and uh, that book I read I read it because I knew Kessler I knew his uh, his uh, his li- uh, his literary works and I liked him very much and I was also very, very interested in politics. And I read, uh, you know, his political kind of uh, essays and, and books like uh, uh, Darkness at Noon, for example, which influenced me greatly. So I knew that he was writing also about so that, that he wrote stuff about kind of 
science. So I went and read The Ghost in the Machine. And that book really fascinated me enormously. Sorry. And what uh, because what I realized was that there were questions in science. He was talking both about uh, psychology and about neo-Darwinism. That there were questions, big questions in science that were philosophical questions. And if you understood the science, you could answer also philosophical questions that were really of importance, but you had, had to know the science. And he mentioned Waddington there. And he mentioned evolution there, of course. So what I did, I immediately went and read Darwin. I was 17 at the time. I read Darwin's uh, Origin of Species. And this book really blew blew my mind in a way because I realized the power of natural selection. The one thing that I didn't understand was if natural selection, if you can think about natural selection and natural selection led to the evolution of the brain, natural selection led to the evolution of the eye, why cannot natural, can't a natural selection lead to the evolution of sophisticated systems for uh, generating intelligent guesses, intelligent variations. Why is this impossible? I was totally naive. I didn't know any biology, mm -hmm. nothing, because I was in a, in a kind of a school where I specialized sort of in philosophy Let's and see. literature yeah. and things like that. I didn't know any biology. But this was a question that seemed to me self-evident. I started asking people and they said, no, it just doesn't exist. <laughs> Such a, but I said, why? If you can do a brain that can plan and that can guess, why can't you evolve a system of generating variations? I didn't know DNA or anything. I mean, you know, I knew about DNA, but I didn't know very much. So that was so, and that fascinated me. And it fascinated me because I, but, but the main thing was there were great debates in evolutionary biology and psychology, which you can only answer and you can only engage with if you knew the science. So I decided, well, that's what I'll do. I'll study biology. And biology was also had this literary sweep into it, you know, the story mm. of life, the evolution of life. It's a big story. And so it appealed to my love of literature in a way. <laughs> yes. So I, and I also read Waddington. So this were, and that was a little bit later. I didn't know any genetics, nothing, absolutely nothing. So I start, So I went and studied biology, and I went for one year to England because my then ex boy, my, my boyfriend and husband, and divorced from whom I divorced, uh, uh, went uh, studied uh, drama there. He was he's an actor, mm. and I went and studied, uh, and I went to study uh, in Birkbeck College, and Marion was my genetics teacher. And uh, the first question and. You know, I fell in love with genetics totally because of the beauty, the elegance, the rigor, mm. and, you know, the power. So I was completely, and I did my PhD in genetics, by the way. But my, and my first question to Marion was, I came to her and I asked her, do you know Waddington? <laughs> you know, and she looked at me and she had this wry, ironic British smile and she said, <laughs> You'd better learn 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 to walk before you run. <laughs> so, so that was my first meeting with Marian, and then I went back to Israel after a year, and uh, we started and I started corresponding with Marian, and we became very close friends. And you know, I, life led me here and there and everywhere. I did my and then I did my uh, a master thesis in microbiology. Uh, and uh, I loved I loved microbiology, and actually I wanted to, and uh, I did it not so much because I really wanted to be a scientist. I still had this idea that I need to know that I need to know in order to be a really good philosopher, a really good writer. I need to know, and I don't know, right? This was a very strong feeling, so I did that, and then I was involved with, uh, and then, but I I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure I really had something to say in biology. My my master's thesis in uh, in microbiology was uh, very successful. I I hit upon an idea which 
very simple idea and it worked. <laughs> it was one of those things that happened to you not very often in your career, at least not mm. in my career. And it was experimental stuff. And then I, but I still wasn't sure because I didn't feel that I have anything really to say in biology, but I read a lot and Marian started sending me books also. And whenever I saw, and we started uh, corresponding and I came to England and she came to Israel. She came to Israel even earlier than that. In uh, that's when we became friends in 75, she, she came to a conference on gerontology because she was doing the genetics of uh, aging. That was her speciality. Mm. This is what this was also her PhD with uh, John Maynard Smith. She did a PhD with him. He was her supervisor. So did she do that, that at Sussex? Uh, no, not at Sussex, at UCL, mm. University College London. It's before he went to Sussex. And and uh, so, so she came to Israel, and then we became very good friends. And she sent me a lot of books, and we start, and we were talking about, you know, about everything in biology, about all the debates of ontogeny and phylogeny, and Gould and uh, uh, punctuated equilibrium, and the selectionist neutralist debate, mm. everything and anything that was a sociobiology, of course, Dawkins, uh, the selfish gene. You know, everything, we were discussing everything. And then uh, I wanted to do a PhD. I, I, my, my personal life got complicated and uh, I had to find a good job because I stopped, by, I stopped doing, uh, after my master's, which was really very successful in terms of output and uh, very, as I said, very, very, very simple kind of uh, experiments which worked. Uh, after my master's, I stopped and I wanted to think and I was doing other things. One of the things that I was doing at that time was uh, a friend of mine uh, who was a philosopher of science, whom I met in a roundabout way uh, through my ex-husband, uh, who was a, also a, th a theater addict. Uh, he was a philosopher of science. His name was Yehuda Elkana. And we started talking. And he realized that I knew quite a lot of uh, you know, biology and also quite a lot of uh, the philosophy of biology that was at the time exist existed at the time. And he gave me a little book, a, a book by Piaget that was translated in 1978 into English about behavior as the engine of evolution, something like that. I don't remember exactly. It was genetic epistemology and the, the kind of... Uh, arguments that uh, Piaget was developing. And I read this book and, in, you know, it's a little book. So I read it in a, one night and put a lot of friend <laughs> and uh, wrote a lot of, around it and, <laughs> and so on. And uh, I realized, and he was, and he mentioned Waddington. And he, he, he misunderstood Waddington, Piaget, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But I got very interested in Piaget because I realized that although he didn't understand uh, Waddington, and he didn't, he made a big mistake there, but never mind. Uh, he he had a very, very good intuition and I got interested in Piaget. So I started reading there, start, I started reading psychology and developmental psychology. And uh, Yehuda uh, wanted to have a conference on uh, on Piaget and he took several people, myself included, who would focus on different aspects of Piaget's work on the anthropology, of course, on the developmental psychology, on the philosophy, and uh, on the anthropology. Did I say anthropology? Mm -hmm. Anyway, but so I started uh, reading a lot of uh, the Piaget stuff and trying to think and uh, trying to understand how he thought about the uh, relationship between development and evolution, which was very different from uh, what you what other people were thinking, was quite similar in some ways to what Popper was saying, by the way, which is very mm. interesting. But and they didn't, they never cited each other ever. Did uh, Piaget pre uh, preempt Popper? I think they were more or less in parallel. No. It's uh, it's a very interesting thing. I think it was really 
I don't think they read each other. Hmm. I think they were both such megalomaniacs. <laughs> <laughs> they just read themselves. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. But anyway, so, and this didn't come to anything, actually, because uh, the person who was doing the anthropology was somebody called Emil Grinzweig, and uh, Emil uh, was uh, murdered mm. in a Peace Now demonstration in uh, 1983, which I missed because I went to the Weizmann Institute to do an experiment. I was doing a PhD then. So it was a peace demonstration. He was a peace activist, so was I. Hmm. And uh, he, he and when he got murdered, right, like we felt like we don't want to have to do anything anymore. It was like everything collapsed. Hmm. But anyway, this was a influence. This influenced me because it made me think a lot about the again about the relationship between ontogeny and phylogeny, not in Gould's sense, not in Waddington's sense, but in a kind of mechanistic sense. Try to think about mechanisms. And after I did my uh, uh, my master's, what I wanted to do was to study, to go on working with bacteria, actually. And I wanted to do a PhD on the question of whether the change of activity in uh, genetic activity, whether genes are expressed or not expressed, has any effect on mutability on the mutability of these genes. This was what interested me, because there were hints in the literature that this is the case. But there weren't any good experiments at the time, in the beginning of the 1980s, we're talking very, very much in the beginning. And But I didn't find anybody who could supervise me. So I gave it up. It was done, by the way, afterwards. There is a connection, of course. And it was done afterwards in Germany. The first paper was published, I think, in 1985. So. But, and I and I was looking for something to to do a PhD on again, not because I wanted to be a professional scientist. I still wasn't sure about what I wanted to do and how I wanted to go with, to go on with my life. But at the time, I was already divorced, and I needed to have a job which was flexible because I had a kid. Mm -hmm. So I needed to have a flexible job, and a PhD was a good solution for me because it was flexible. And I knew that I will get a grant because I had good records. So I went and did, so I chose a PhD in about X chromosome inactivation because it really fascinated me the idea that the whole chromosome that you can have regulation at the level of a whole chromosome, not just like you know a gene or something like this, like you know you, you in like the lac operon or, or one of those uh, uh, cistrons. But a whole chromosome, a huge chromosome, very important chromosome, like the X chromosome with over 1,000 genes on it. How do you do it? <laughs> yes. It cannot work in the kind of lac operon way. There must be something else. And that fascinated me, and I started uh, working on that. So there was somebody who was doing that, and I started working on epigenetics, on uh, DNA methylation. I thought DNA methylation may have something to do with it. So I started working on that, and that was my PhD. My PhD was trying to find the relationship between X chromosome, the inactive inactivation of the X chromosome. The inact I was looking at the cell line where there was one active chromosome, one, one inactive, and I was trying to, and I was mani I was manipulating methylation by giving a chemical called 5-azacytidine, which leads to an inhibition. Of the uh, of the uh, methylating enzymes, and therefore leads to demethylation. And I was trying to see whether it also changes something at the chromosomal level, uh, at uh, the uh, the timing of replication, whether it changes the time of replication from early to not early, uh, from late, sorry, from late to to not early but normal, and it did but for a short time. Hmm. And that made me think, because here was an epigenetic change, but it was transient, it was developmental, it was induced, it was at the chromosomal level. And I thought, well, if you can do it in this way, so, okay, there are mechanisms which bring back the the inactivation, but, on, but if you can do it so 
relatively easily during development. And I knew all the literature at the time that existed. There wasn't so much at that time about issues that were related to it. If you can change the activity of genes and a whole chromosome, well, then is it really the case that everything that happens during development gets erased and deleted during a metagenesis. It just didn't make sense to me. Biology doesn't work like that. You don't have a delete button. Hmm. You, it, it must be, it has to be more complicated. Yes, you have to, to go back to totipotency. Absolutely. But that's it. This is the constraint, not the delete button. So that was my thing. I started thinking in this direction because I was always thinking evolutionarily. And Marian at the time was working on on uh, the on polytin chromosomes and what happened to them during aging. So she was looking at chromatin and she was seeing changes in chromatin. She never published this stuff. And we started talking about it. That was 1983, I think beginning of 1983, something like this. And we started thinking like that, and we came very quickly to the conclusion that it just cannot be the case that this epigenetic, that method, we were thinking about methylation at the time. This is what was known. People didn't know about RN, small RNAs. This happened only in the 90s. And uh, very little was known about the reconstruction of histone uh, uh, modification patterns. Nothing was known at the time. I mean, people knew about uh, histones, of course, but not much was known about histone modification, their role in uh, in chromosomal regulation and uh, gene expression and so on. A lot, and the, the, the epigenetic system that was under, best understood, it's very complicated, but it was nevertheless best understood at the time was DNA methylation and I was working on it. And Marian was working about polythene, on, on this polythene chromosomes and how they ch how the changes that she saw with age. And uh, so we started talking about it, and we and we very and we started and I started reading around it. So I was doing my PhD, but I was also reading very very broadly. Uh, and uh, our face, first paper actually we finished it in eighty six. It was called, it was the way in which about meiotic pairing constraint and the evolution of sex chromosomes, it was called. And that was about the way about the evolution of, and that was about the way in which the chromatin changes both in the in active X and also in the active X in the male during a metagenesis, and how this affects, must affect the evolution of sex chromosomes. Then we wrote another paper, a huge paper that was the most difficult, the most, uh, so much work you cannot imagine. It was about the evolution of heteromorphic sex chromosomes in all taxa. So mm. we read literally, I don't know, probably more than a thousand papers. Oh. A lot, a lot, a lot. And Marian, you know, was very, very strict. You know, she was completely but at the end at the end we understood also that there can be epigenetic inheritance inheritance of this kind of developmental variation we were thinking about dna methylation but we realized that there are other systems very quickly not dna uh, uh, we realized i since i was working also on uh, i will i was working also on chromatin not only on dna uh, uh, on uh, i was working on the sensitivity to dna as one on uh, in when I was doing my PhD, and that is something that is not on that is affecting chromatin basically, is is dependent on the structure of chromatin, the sensitivity to this enzyme DNA is one that can cut DNA, and that has a lot to do with the way that uh, DNA is packaged, and with and that has a lot to do with histones of course the way that histones are connected to each other. So I was think so we were thinking about that and we came very quickly to the conclusion that methylation is one inheritance system, one epigenetic inheritance system. Mm. We were thinking also about self-sustaining loops, kind of positive feedback loops, and we were thinking about the uh, the, the chromatin, the histones, 
don't know much about histone modifications, but we realize that histones and the kind of proteins that are attached to it can have different structures and, there, and this can be reconstructed. So we realized that and we started writing about that. And the, the story is very, from this point of view, is very interesting. We, tr we, we, we finished, I did, I finished my PhD in 87 and I went to study and I went to England to the MRC unit in London, uh, which Anne McLaren was, uh, Anne McLaren was a very famous developmental biologist. Uh, I think she was the first woman secretary of the Royal Society. Uh, and uh, I did, I tried to do some kind of uh, experiments there with Marilyn Monk. Nothing very much came of this experiment and I didn't stay there for very long, but uh, I talked a lot with Anne, was very, very sympathetic because at the mm. time everything was, we tried to already to publish our paper, but it wasn't accepted for publication, of course. Uh, and uh, the the big one, the the important one, the one that, where we realized that this is an epigenetic, that there is there are different epigenetic inheritance systems and that th this must have evolutionary implications. This we realized already in 86 and which started, tried and we sort of polished this paper when I was mm -hmm. there in, in England. And Anne was very, very sympathetic and uh, she thought we were right actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. And I met there also Robin Holiday who was one of the major uh, figures who, who who thought about epigenetic inheritance and uh, not in evolution, but in development. And he even thought that from time to time there are mistakes and there are there is a possibility of the inheritance of uh, epigenetic mistakes, right? We didn't think it was just mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> but there, there is a strategy. An evolutionary strategy, mm. and that it is part of what is happening all the time, not just rarely. Now, in order to show that this is the case, now you don't have at the time when we started, we don't have experiments at the molecular level that are showing that something like this happens, mm. and nobody believes that this happens. You know, when I'm talking to people about it, they think that something's wrong with me. I mean, that I, I'll, either I'm an idiot or I'm a megalomaniac or I, I don't know, or a combination of the two or whatever, hmm. uh, or just I don't know biology. And so we, and, but, you know, Marian and I are talking and we and we say, if we're right, then it must be the case that there are a lot of uh, examples in the literature at the phenotypic level that are showing it that you cannot explain by Mendelian inheritance and you cannot explain by cytoplasmic inheritance. So let's have a look. And sure enough, when you look, you find them. And we found a lot, not, not at the molecular level, but they exist, they are there. People repeated them even, but what do you do with them? You don't know what to do with them. So what was happening was we're trying to publish, then, then I go back to Israel in, eight, in the beginning of 88. I go back to Israel and, Mar, and we're trying to publish this paper and get rejected. And because, of the, because it is of no interest to the general public. Hmm. Is that what the reviewers said? Yes, uh, the, uh, nature and science. And uh, then Marion meets Minot Smith in a conference. Mm. Now they they don't see each other a lot, but they're good. But she did a PhD with him, and you know he respected, and they published together, and he has a lot of respect to her because he knows how how clever she is, and yeah. uh, so on, and uh, and also what a great scientist she is. She was a phen phenomenal experimentalist, not only experimentalist, also theoretical uh, thinker, but also a fantastic experimentalist, unlike me. <laughs> I'm better in theory, <laughs> but I, I mean, I'm working, I work very hard with the experiments. I repeated every experiment like 50 times because I was so unsure of myself. Mm. But anyway, uh, so she meets him and they start the normal academic gossip, you know, how it goes, you know, they start talking about this and that. And she, and he says, what are you doing? And she tells him, oh, I have this friend of mine, you know, this Israeli 
woman Eva and we're trying to and we're doing this and that or and uh, but we don't manage to publish it and uh, John says oh you know send me the paper and uh, and uh, and he says I'm going to Princeton to the Institute of High Studies there and I don't have any idea in my head what to do there maybe I will knock your paper so because she told him a little bit what it was all about yeah. and she said you're welcome so she sent the paper to him and of course and he thinks we're wrong but he thinks it's very interesting and he wrote to Wolpert who was the editor of general theoretical biology and he said to him look read this paper and send it to reviewers because I think it's an important paper even though I disagree mm. And Wolpert read the paper and sent it to reviewers, and the paper was accepted for publication. Hmm. So that was uh, that's, that was in 1989, beginning of 1989. At long last, the paper was published. <laughs> and that was thanks to John. So yeah. John took the paper and wrote a paper against us about dual mm. inheritance. And then we wrote a paper against him. So to show why he was wrong. And that started the very good relationship between us because mm. uh, uh, first of all, uh, he liked Marian and he also liked me and we sort of got along very well. We argued all the time and, uh, and it was a lot of fun. And uh, then I was, uh, and then I gave a lecture about, I sent him a paper that I wrote in 1990 that also was only published in 94. Uh, this paper I wrote in 1990, a paper called uh, The Evolution of Levels of uh, Inheritance Systems and the Evolution of Levels of Individuality. Mm. And that was about the growth of, uh, of complexity of, uh, of different types of individuals during evolution through the lens of looking at different inheritance systems. Uh, it was the genetic, the epigenetic, and the cultural, behavioral and cultural inheritance systems. And uh, that was a paper that I sent to him, and I gave a lecture on it, and I don't think he read it, uh, but, uh, but I gave a lecture on it in 1993 in Montpellier. And he got very excited because I, I wrote it, I was very influenced by Leo Bass, and I didn't know that he was writing a book on transitions. Mm, uh, the I, transition to, I called it in the transition to individual, to new levels of individuality. That's how it was called. It had the transition <laughs> word in it. I didn't have a clue that they were writing it. And he was there and Ersh was there. That's when I first mm. met uh, Ersh. And, and John got very, very excited about the paper. I told him it can't be published. It is, uh, you know. I don't manage to publish it. It was moldering uh, for, I don't know, how, two years or something like that in, uh, in, uh, at the editorial level. And he got again and he sort of, sort of told me where to, to send it or something like that. It got published in 94. And he was very excited and he said to Ersh, look, this woman, you have to take her with you to, to, the, uh, uh, to the theoretical biology group which Ersh was uh, organizing at the time. I mean, by that time, John knew me very well because we were we met more than once. And he invited me to Sussex and I gave a lecture in Sussex and so on. And we discussed things and we were on very good terms, although we disagreed. Uh, and also, you know, it was not just me, it was also Marian. We were always together. And uh, so I went to Budapest for five months. And that was one of the most wonderful periods in my intellectual life because it was like a miracle. It was, we were a group of people, relatively young people, completely open to every crazy idea. Hmm. And everything we touched worked, but everything. I mean, there was a very good mathematician there, Joseph Hofbauer, and, uh, and uh, there were some people with very good theoretical computational skills and the people and Ersh was there and I was there and uh, there was also there were some linguists there and artists and we all sort of worked together somehow and it was really like really like like some kind of synergetic kind of interaction which was wonderful and that was uh, 94 95 and 90 in the beginning of 95 we published our book uh, the first book, me and Marian, because we realized that we can't go on writing articles that five people in the world read. Mm. 
Hmm. Okay, it's always you, you can always you know only tell part of the story, and we had a big story to tell. That's how we we felt. So we decided to tell it, and uh, we started writing the book in 1990, and it was published by Oxford University Press in 95, and they sent it to John, who vouched for our sanity. <laughs> So he's responsible. So he, he really supported you at multiple steps. Yes, he did. Yeah. So that was our book, The, the uh, Epigenetic Inheritance and mm. Evolution of the Lamarckian Dimension. And then I think you received a lot of pushback against the book. Well, I received a pushback all the time. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, only in Budapest, although that's where we argued, that's where we thought in a constructive way. It wasn't... You know, I, it was not a problem to uh, to be criticized. It was a problem to be patronized. Mm. And uh, a lot of people really, you know, they had a knee-jerk kind of reaction to what we said. But we knew what we were talking about. And, you know, I'm not saying that we were right, that because we, we read a lot and we were, very well informed about what we were talking about mm. but at least that gave us the credit for that but of course nobody gives you credit for that especially if you're a woman and a young woman mm. relatively young anyway so but but things began to change because although there was a pushback against the book there was also quite a lot of appreciation the book got very good reviews on the whole at the beginning, there was something in uh, Time Supplement, uh, uh, Educational Supplement, or something like that, by somebody who wrote, who completely slaughtered the book, didn't understand very much, unfortunately, <laughs> but slaughtered the book, and we thought, that's it. The book is finished. But fortunately, other people wrote very good reviews about it, even if they disagreed. Hmm. But at least they saw there is a lot of scholarship in it, and there are serious arguments. So you have to present counter arguments if you don't agree. Come on. So that, and then things started moving also because a lot of people have been uh, been discovering the, the a lot about the epigenetic mechanisms that allow uh, epigenetic inheritance. Already at the end of the of the eighties, eighty nine, I think. There were beginning to be experiments with transgenes that showed that the state of activity of the introduced transgenes were, was inherited in plants and in fungi. So there were the beginnings. And then in the 90s, there was an explosion of this because of the mm. genetic engineering. And the genetic engineering people, they didn't care about theory. They didn't care about Lamarckian inheritance, Darwinian <laughs> inheritance, really didn't interest them. What they were interested in was the mechanisms and to make this work. Mm. And if it didn't work because there was some kind of methylation it superimposed on the transgene, then this was, this is what they discovered. Okay, how do what do we do about it? How can we go again? <laughs> yeah, that was interested. In. But of course, and and then you can uh, people found that it's not only transgenes; it's also endogenous genes. And then this the the whole uh, uh, it, and it isn't just methylation; it's also other kind of uh, mm. uh, modes of transmission of information, which are not uh, based on DNA sequence variations. And then in the uh, in 1998, I think, came the the big paper on uh, RNA, small RNAs, and their inheritance in C. elegans. Although already there were hints about that in plants, not hints, more than hints. Hmm. People were finding this in plants before it was found in the, in actually in C. elegans, but the C. elegans work got the glory, and they did wonderful experiments, I must say. Hmm. So, you know, so this started developing, but already at that time we were, I, you know, we were thinking, okay, there are, is this, epi the, we, understand, we understood that there is, uh, we understood the RNA story, incorporated it very quickly into our framework, because it didn't, it wasn't known before, about the big framework about epigenetic inheritance, how can, how it can happen, and, and that was, uh, 
And then things that, you know, people got very interested in it for all kinds of reasons, for medical reasons. Mm. I mean, cancer research and uh, metabolic diseases and ecological uh, aspects of uh, epigenetics and so on and so forth were becoming very, very important. Evolutionary biologists were very reluctant, especially the population geneticists. Hmm. This is the last bastion of resistance. Why, why were they so opposed to it? I guess they were socialized into a different way of thinking. Hmm. It was all, you know, everything is, uh, evolution is a change in gene frequencies. Yeah. And genes are DNA sequences. That's it. So it was good that uh, genetic engineers didn't hold on to big theoretical commitments, just try to get the work done. I yes, I think in a way it's it was that was how it happened. I think hmm. in some ways because they really didn't care about uh, about the big about whether it was Lamarckian or Darwinian or this or that. They they just tried to make uh, uh, transgenic uh, organisms, right? That's what they wanted to do. And uh, and they, and molecular biologists were very open to this hmm. because it was they were interested in mechanisms. And okay, we don't we still don't understand fully what is going on in the germline. I mean, there's a lot to be discovered yet. But although we're getting somewhere, it's getting a little bit better. I mean, but there's still many many riddles and many many questions in terms of the mechanisms involved. Not any more in terms of the phenomena. Now, you also wrote a book in 2000 with Eitan Avital on animal traditions with behavioral inheritance. How was how did that come about? Did you just uh, see that oh, there's a surprising epigenetic inheritance that evolutionary biologists denied the possibility of and then tried to investigate other forms of non-genetic inheritance? Yes, I mean, Eitan was a friend of mine from ages ago hmm. or so, and uh... He is brilliant uh, um, behavioral ecologist, and uh, we were talking quite a lot about behavior, uh, just you know informally talking about it. And uh, yes, and it was clear to me that there are many inheritance systems already in the mid. I, I mean, already in the nineties when mm. we were writing the book, uh, epigenetic inheritance and uh, evolution. That was clear that there is a, that this is just one way one uh, one way of transmitting information from generation to generation. There's cultural inheritance, of course, and I was influenced by the way also in the way that I thought about modeling uh, modeling uh, uh, epigenetic uh, uh, the evolution of mm -hmm. epigenetic system. I was uh, I, I was influenced by Kabbalist Sforza and Feldman work on cultural inheritance, their models, uh, and Boyd and Richardson. I read all these things mm. in the 1980s. I read a lot about cultural evolution. So I was thinking about cultural evolution as an inheritance system. And I was thinking about epigenetics as an inheritance system. And then when I was talking with Eitan, who was a behavioral ecologist and was looking at animals, we thought, well, of course, there is also social learning. So let's have a look at it. Hmm. And we started writing something about adoption, about how adoption can be can lead to a kind of how adopt how the structure uh, adopting adoption we called it. That was one of the papers that we wrote. But we wrote basically about the fact that there is a lot of social learning and that information gets transmitted in this way. And then and we wrote a series of papers about it, about different aspects of it. One of them was the inheritance of the strategy of adoption and through social learning. And, uh, and that got people interested. Mm. Somebody wrote about us in the New York Times and things like that. And uh, people got really interested in this. And uh, we decided, and again, we published a series of papers and we thought, well, we actually have quite a lot to say about it. Let's write a book. So we wrote a book. And but and I was working also in parallel at the same time with uh, Daniel Dorr, who is a, who was an ex student of mine. I talked uh, in a, he was in a program of a um, special program for uh, ex uh, excellent students in Tel Aviv University, and I taught them genetics. Uh, and 
and he then he became a linguist and he went and did his, uh, a PhD in linguistics in Stanford. And he came back to Israel and we started talking about language and about the evolution of language and uh, about the relationship between the transmission of linguistic uh, content uh, of transmission of information through language and the genetic evolution of language. What is the relationship between these two aspects? So we started, and this was start, and we started that in 1996. We're still talking about it <laughs> to this day. And uh, it's a very, very important subject. Mm. So I was thinking about all these kind of things. And so the book with Aiton came as a result of the, uh, you know, the fact that we, it became very clear to us that social learning, that a lot of things that were, that we can reinterpret a lot of things about animal behavior in terms of social learning. And that it was a very, very important uh, aspect of animal evolution, of uh, mm. the, the evolution of social animals. So and we wrote this book and it came out in, nine, in 2000. Mm. Did that then give rise to perhaps the first sparks of interest in trying to investigate animal consciousness? No, actually not directly. What it did hmm. was I gave a series of lectures about uh, in the Van Leer Institute in Jerusalem about inheritance systems, about the genetic, epigenetic uh, and uh, um, social learning, uh, behavioral and uh, uh, symbolic thing, and this gave rise to some extent, uh, mm. and this gave rise to evolution in four dimensions. It didn't, I didn't want to touch the subject of consciousness. <laughs> this is the honest truth. And when Simona came and started talking to me about it, Simona mm. Ginsburg, who is also a friend from, from ever, I always work with people who are friends because you can trust them and you can do anything, you know, you can argue and it's okay. Hmm. There is no, there are no power games. You have to trust <laughs> people if you, work, if you want to work with them. That's a good model. Yeah. And also, you know, I always work with other people because other people know a lot more than I do about certain aspects hmm. of the subject and we complement each other. So, you know, I can't write a book about animal behavior Without, I wouldn't write the book about animal behavior without Aiton and his vast encyclopedic knowledge of uh, of uh, of, any, of animal behavior and uh, and his insights into it. And I will, and you know, with Marian, it was a, a, a kind of different. It was synergetic, and and but also she was a fabulous geneticist. And uh, actually, you know, I knew genetics too. I did a PhD in this in the subject, so I I, I knew. I knew it, but we knew different aspects of it, mm. and uh, and we came from different traditions of thought. And so anyway, but but and I wouldn't write anything about language uh, just you know without Danny Daniel Dore, who who who, who is a professional linguist, mm. right? He he really you know, and he taught me linguistics, and in the same way that Aiton taught me a lot about animal behavior. Although I was always what I, I loved watching animals, but you know I, I wasn't professional. I came obviously, so I th so, and then uh, so then we thought of bringing this together. Uh, I mean, Marian and I thought of bringing together all these things, and that's how evolution four dimensions came came to be. And but I didn't want to do anything to do with consciousness. I told Monsi came to me and said, look, she, she was interested in the mind body kind of problem. She's a neurobiologist and, uh, and very, you know, very good neurobiologist. And she is also interested in philosophy of mind and in philosophy in general, philosophy of science. And she's a very good friend and we always talked about things. And uh, she said to me, look, uh, let's do something together about this. And I said, I'm not touching this subject. No way. With a barge pole, I'm not touching it because <laughs> it will drive me crazy. I don't have anything to say to it, anything original to say about it. I don't want to do it. And she insisted and insisted and insisted. I think it took her a year or so. Hmm. I don't remember, maybe more. 
And uh, one day she came to me and uh, and she said to me, look, there's nothing about evolution. Nobody did a, a, a serious evolutionary work on this since the, I don't know, uh, the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and, you know, it was like, you know, at first it was simple, then it is more complex, and then it is even more complex. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, uh, this is not what we want. This is not revolutionary biology, right? So let's think about it constructively. And I said, Monsi, I don't have anything to say about it. Monsi is her nickname. Hmm. And, uh, and then she trapped me. She came one day with Aristotle. And uh, with the with and she knows I'm an addict. I'm a fan of Aristotle. <laughs> and she said, Le, "You know what? Let's read on the soul, the hmm. animal. Maybe we can see something." And of course, I cannot say no to that. I mean, I talk <laughs> the animal. Yes. I, I I read it many many times, but every time I read it, I just I get blown. My my hmm. my, you know, I just. There was nobody like him, ever. Anyway, so I think. And it's just unbelievable insights into, into, into psychology, into biology, into, into whatever. So that's how it started. And then suddenly it started, you know, getting sort of uh, evolutionizing Aristotle. You know, to put this framework that Aristotle was putting into an evolutionary framework, mm. because that's how I think. For and you know, it is a very. This is the lens through which I look at things. I look through the evolutionary lens all the time. This is what brought me into biology, and this is what keeps me in biology. And uh, and so I was. So that's how we started, and then uh, you know, it took twelve years <laughs> of work. Yeah, I have a similar experience, I would say. Before I started my PhD, I thought I would never touch consciousness. That's just speculative. No one's going to take me serious. But then uh, Heather Browning, my now wife, obviously worked on animal welfare. And to think about animal welfare, you inevitably have to address the question of animal consciousness. And Peter Godfrey Smith, of course, wrote his book on the octopus and consciousness. Yeah. And then I saw... Oh, the, the evolution of the sensitive soul it's such a big book <laughs> now we're it it's no longer speculation that we have now that's I mean, at least empirically rigorous speculation if anything yeah exactly right. and you know it and it was really for me intellectually it was a huge huge effort hmm. I mean, Really, it was for me much more difficult mm. than uh, epigenetic and epigenetic inheritance and all this. I mean, I was there with epigenetic inheritance from the beginning. Yeah, you know, I really knew the literature extremely well at the time because mm. you could follow it. And of course, now I can't. There's no way you can follow it anymore. I mean, there are massive, massive amounts of information. Mm. But at the time, I was on top of it. But with consciousness, you know, just to learn, mm. it was so hard. I read and read and read and read. And it was not just reading, it was thinking about it. And also the, 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 the problem is so much more difficult in, in, in many ways. So that was really a very, very demanding intellectually period of my life. I, I think we thought we met once a week every week to talk, me and Simona, for years. Mm. And read, and before that we of course read a lot, and discussed and discussed and discussed, and then write, discussed it and discard, write, and <laughs> tear it to pieces, and so on. But it was, but it became clear to us, I think around 2006, that we actually, that's when we got the associate, the learning, the associative mm. learning, uh, uh, idea that this is the level at which we have to look for two years we were look we were we were getting lost 
And that's when it started sort of gelling, it gelled. And we published our first papers, we managed to publish them in 2007. That was the first papers. Mm. But they were still the beginning of the ideas. And then 2010, which was already much more, but it was not, but we all the time developed the, the I mean, we, we learned and elaborated and still actually find new ways of thinking and uh, and uh, explaining to ourselves and to others mm. what we, uh, how, how we think about it. Yeah, for the listeners, could you perhaps explain the basic idea of unlimited associative learning that you introduce in the book? Yes, the idea is that, uh, first of all, that there is actually evolutionarily an important connection between cognition and consciousness. We are today used to think that there is no such connections because we can have very, very elaborate cognitive systems mm. like AI that are not conscious. But in evolution of biological organisms, this was not the case. There was a link. That's one thing that we are saying. The link is not simple. And it's and consciousness is quite a complex, according to us, system property of mm. a living organism. It's not a simple property in the same way that life is not simple chemical property. Life is very complex chemical property. And we think that, uh, but you can think about it in terms of biochemical mechanisms that bring about something that you call life, living, a living process. In the same way, there are cognitive processes that when they are coupled together, they lead to something that we recognize as consciousness or minimal consciousness. So what is unlimited associative learning? We think what we were trying to do was to think about the origin of a, unlimited associative learning is the ability to form both unified kind of percepts. Like you see the apple as both red and round and mm. smooth. And at the same time, to differentiate between different aspects. So the ability both to unify and differentiate. It, ha it is the ability uh, so that you can discriminate between different types of apples, for example. So discrimination learning is very, very important. The other thing is to have some kind of, uh, a, 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 of, a, of a temporal depth. Experiences have temporal depth. The present is not an infinitely small intersection mm. between past and future. It has duration. And this duration can be, you can understand it in terms of learning, for example, when you think about something that is take, called trace conditioning. That is that you can under that you that you can learn that something that happens at time t1 anticipate something that happens in T2, although there is no overlap between T1 and T2. And in order for this to happen, there must be some kind of notion of duration within the system. So this, this so unlimited associative learning requires this complex kind of discrimination learning. It requires trace conditioning. And when you learn, you always, what does it mean to learn? To learn means to evaluate. Something is good, something is bad, something is better, something is worse, something is neutral. It doesn't matter, hmm. right? All these kind of things. And so when you learn, you have to apply this kind of values or balance. And, the, and when you have unlimited associative learning, you have, a, you, you have the ability to switch. So in one circumstance, something is good. In another circumstance, it's not so good. And then in the third circumstance, it's actually very bad. And in yet another one, it doesn't, it, it doesn't matter at all, mm. and so on. And you can switch between these things according to circumstances. You are not fixed. So it's not a kind of reflex that is innate and fixed, but it's really changing according to circumstances. And the third thing that the unlimited associative learning allows you to do is to learn on the basis of learning. So you can have a chain of learnings so that you have, so that learning is generative in this kind of way. Yes, and, and you can reiterate and, and kind of recursive, sorry. 
it is it is obviously generative because you can combine a lot of things together and learn about different combinations of things. And this is part of the story. So, and now, and when you analyze this uh, capacities of learning, because there's four base, uh, basic capacities of learning, you can also make all kinds of trade-offs. This is better than this. I prioritize this rather than that. Yes. And so on, this kind of things. Uh, when you look at this and you analyze this, you see that they satisfy the kind of list of capacities that we usually attribute, not we, but, ev but a, a lot of scholars from philosophy, from neurobiology, from cognitive science, from psychology, from behavior, mm. this list of capacities that people usually attribute to the ability to be conscious, right? The, the unity of consciousness, the temporal depth, the the flexibility of evaluation and so on and so forth. Hmm. So, so we focused on the evolution of this system, of this learning system, because we thought that it is what we called an evolutionary transition marker for consciousness. So that when all these capacities are in place, when you can learn in this place, this means that you have already, that you are conscious. Before that, we don't know. We don't. We, we cannot be sure. We don't say you are not. Yes, but we say once you pass this threshold, for sure you are conscious. And then we looked. Okay, who passed mm. this threshold? And we found out that there are three major groups: the vertebrates, probably all the vertebrates, some of the mollusks, the coleoid cephalopods, cephalopods, and uh, some of the arthropods. Now, which and and whether it is a complete list, this is an open question because most of the time we don't know enough hmm. about uh, a, about learning because it is a very very although there is a lot of work there are 150 years of uh, work on learning that that's why one of the reasons this book took so long. And we also wrote to <laughs> all the experts <laughs> of the set of the strange groups of. You know, to people who did rot, who were working on rotifers, and people who were working mm. on some kind of some f film that we never heard about, and we wrote to them, "What do you know about learning in your film? What is yeah. known about this?" We, to all the experts, we wrote just to you know, so that we are sure that we are covering the ground properly, because it's very difficult to cover the ground, of course, and of course we missed, but uh, but we tried very hard not to miss. Hmm. And uh, so we don't know. It's very, very patchy, and things. Can, and I think that we have to update, also as we go along, to update hmm. uh, this uh, list of who is actually conscious. Of yeah. So in the last four years, have you seen any interesting studies on associative learning and other animals that would uh, make you I think that there, you would... Uh, there are interesting things about limited associative learning. Hmm. For example, in uh, in Cnidarians. In uh, in Medusa, and uh, that's something that we anticipated actually hmm. in our book, which was very nice <laughs> for <laughs> us. And uh, but yes, so there, are, you know, people are trying to to look at it and find it. Hmm. Uh, we have a big list of papers that have been published since we, you know, right. we one day we'll update the book. I don't think we'll ever do that because I don't think we'll live that long. But. Uh, <laughs> But uh, it's it's we have a big, huge list of things here. We have to update it here. We have to update and this we mm. have to refine. And here, you know, you know, this was probably a bit wrong. I mean, we learn all the time. But uh, yeah, so I think that people are also getting more interested in this kind of strategy as something that is really that really made a big difference to to evolutionary difference. To animal, to uh, to to, anim to to the to the history of animals. Mm. Now, in the book, you also talk about another type of soul. Aristotle talks about the rational soul as something that you might perhaps explain in a in a similar way as a kind of major transition in evolution. Have you made any progress there? Ah. Oh. Well, <laughs> I'm thinking about it, and uh, we're thinking about it. I told you that I'm very interested in the evolution of language. Mm. And I think that uh, language, 
is uh, was a very very important it's a very important you can you can think about it as a very important kind of evolutionary transition marker for to the sense to the irrational soul i'm not saying that it i think that when you think about human evolution and what goes into the the into human evolution before language there were already we were already human in many many ways hmm. but i think that what we call the rational soul very much depends on the ability to to reflect hmm. about our feelings our beliefs right our, and once this came into being the a whole new values became of the, uh, i mean it was not simply that we became more complicated but we acquired a new value system the values became something like the abstract values of truth hmm. of beauty of justice and this kind of values began began to to guide human evolution so human social evolution but also individual evolution and it was through language that this was enabled Mm. so in 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 a big way there there are precursors before that of course but uh, and they are very very important and very interesting but i think that this that the appearance of this kind of value system is a marker of what we call the the great teleological transitions so you know the great marker for the evolution of life mm. is uh, survival and reproduction these are the values that you have to satisfy the values for the sensitive soul for the conscious feelings feeling organism is the satisfaction of needs felt needs that you feel yes and the satis- and the values for the rational soul are the abstract values of justice of beauty of of truth and they are abstract in in you know and uh, but they are very very important and they they make us into a very very different kind different ty- type of being so i think that yes this was a major transition Th- this is what characterizes the rational soul it's mm. not rational i call it rational following aristotle it's not necessarily rational in the sense that it is doing always the rational thing right <laughs> right it often doesn't <laughs> we often don't but nevertheless we are uh, the products of a great evolutionary transition i believe mm yeah i'm probably biased partially at least by coming from an economics background but to me at least it seems very clear that this transition towards barter and trade was at least yeah partly influential for this major transition because humans suddenly had this evolutionary payoff from being able to have an, a different form of evaluation that wasn't just hedonic but could think farther into the future think about commitments about the value of commodities across time how you might trade them with someone else in the future and then this process of moving away from hedonic values could have given rise to these much more abstract values like truth justice beauty right Yes this is one way of thinking about it i think that hmm. uh, it's a very you know when you're thinking about uh, i mean you can think about it from this direction you can think about yeah. it from the direction of the increase uh, of the uh, the evolution of uh, the feeling of free hmm. will of agency right and uh, so this is another way of thinking about it i think that uh, daniel dennett is thinking in this yeah. very much in this way and i think there is a lot of value in thinking about it about how freedom evolves <laughs> and um and it's very important and uh, another thing which is related to it is uh, our sense of justice mm. which is related which again you can think about it you can think about the evolution of that and all these things intersect and uh, but i think that in all these cases some a, a, there were precursors as i say before obviously but uh, once you had 
language joined this evolutionary mm -hmm. kind of uh, uh, co-evolutionary spirals, uh, I think it made a very, very big difference to all of them. Would you say there's then perhaps differences depending on the languages different groups of humans are using? I think that uh, it's a very good question. I think that uh, we now realize that the kind of Chomskyan uh, uh, innate uh, universal language is a little bit of a mirage. Mm. Uh, but I think that uh, humans have, but that, so I think that languages have obviously language evolved and there is a genetic basis to, to language evolution, but it is much more domain general than we think, I mm. think. Although there are some specific things and we wrote yeah. about it, we do not completely agree with Hay, uh, with Celia Hayes. About about this issue, we think that there is that the shape of plasticity mm. is important in this case too. So, uh, but uh, but nevertheless, we think that this that the, that she's right in in uh, in emphasizing the importance of the general domain mechanisms that. Are, that are relating the specific domain of language with others, with other domains, and uh, that are sort of, in a way, constructing them developmentally during development. But a lot of it is developmental construction. And we're very interested in that, Daniel and uh, myself at the moment, and we're thinking about a project that might clarify this way of thinking further mm -hmm. because it's as i as i told you everything is still work in progress yeah i mean everything. you obviously have a lot of research interests so do you have any specific plans for the next five years where the research is going to take you <laughs> we are talking <laughs> with a woman who is 72 okay <laughs> <laughs> So first of all, I hope that I live that long. Yeah. Second, I hope that my intellectual capacities are not will not deteriorate. Mm. I don't make very long term plans. I have all kinds. I want to understand. I want to understand this. Uh, um, I want to understand language evolution better than I mm -hmm. do, and the rational soul. I want to understand better than I do. I think there is quite a lot of work there, and I'm going through the language route. Because this is also what I'm, uh, I, I know a little bit more about, but not only. Uh, I'm very interested in the evolution of the sense of the of the beautiful. Mm. It's very interesting, and uh, so you know, so I'm working on, so I'm reading about all these things. What will happen to it? I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I guess moving away a bit then from the academic research ideas, you've traveled a lot across your life. What were your highlights of the places you've visited? Ah, uh, it's, you know, there are beautiful places in the world, but it's always uh, really, always people, I guess, that uh, I, I, I was recently... In um, in Mexico with Anat, mm. uh, who is my friend and uh, who did the illustration for the sensitive soul, also for this new book, you know the uh, the picturing the mind. Yes. Well, you sent me a copy in Tedder. Yes. I'm very thankful. Yes, for. Yes. Yeah. yes, consciousness through the lens of evolution. So, and it was translated into into Spanish in Mexico. Mm. We traveled, and we have very, very good friends in Mexico. We've been to Mexico like three times. I love Mexico. We love Mexico, me and my friend Anad. And it was fantastic. But I traveled uh, a lot with Marian all over the world. I mean, we were in Africa, for example, with Marian in Botswana, watching animals. Mm. And that was amazing. Yeah. Right, it was a wonderful thing. It was just before Marin became sick. Mm. 
Okay, so we managed to do that, and that was a, and we went to the Galapagos together, mm. uh, and that was also absolutely wonderful experience. So there are many, many, and most, and many of these experiences are linked to. So some of them are linked to looking at animals like Botswana and the Galapagos, where we just looked at animals and animal behavior. And that is what we did. Well, Marion was a great zoologist and very good, very, very, very good eyes, very observant. And uh, but many, many, in many cases, it is all linked to, and I mean, one one of the great travel, uh, great trips we did, I did with Marian, was to Novosibirsk in Russia, to Siberia, to look at the foxes. We were invited there hmm. by the Russians at, uh, in, I think it was 2007 or something like that. Interesting. Uh, yeah. And that was... A fantastic experience. We were in um, Akademigo Rodok, which is the science city that they created in the forest and uh, near Novosibirsk. And uh, it, it was fascinating, fascinating to meet the people, fascinating to see the foxes. It's, it's usually a combination of people, new places, uh, I mean, completely comp different in many ways, very different cultural worlds, but nevertheless, uh, not that something you can communicate and understand, communicate with and understand. That was a great experience. So there are many, many experiences that we that I had uh, traveling, and uh, of course, I told you about Budapest. Mm. It was absolutely wonderful. Marian used to come to Budapest, and John came to Budapest, and they got drunk together <laughs> <laughs> with Ers. <laughs> I don't drink very much. <laughs> mm. I'm not good at it, but uh, unfortunately, but that's it. But yeah, it was you know I traveled a lot, and I got a lot out of it. Hmm. Yeah, do you have any advice looking back at your life for how, I mean, researchers, but maybe also the general public, sort of the secret for staying happy and motivated? Of course, it seems like you have been staying motivated to pursue research for decades after decades, keeping on reading hundreds, thousands of books. Do you have advice? I don't know, you know, I think, I think you should do what really uh, you're passionate about mm -hmm. and not make a lot of, uh, don't, all this kind of people who are so busy networking mm. and thinking about how they are, how, what people will think about them. And if this, you know, I, I don't think this is very good. I don't think it works. <laughs> I think you have to do really what you are passionate about mm -hmm. and do it as well as you can and put all your soul into it and all and very hard work into it. But, you know, not play too many, too many academic games if one can, if you can help it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess we're moving closer to the end of this interview now at the moment course you're in Israel it seems like the situation is not great at the moment right it's um, pretty horrible yeah um, not only in Israel I mean it's worse in Gaza at the moment that's right yeah do you see it seems like the, that it's becoming more and more radicalized uh, the sites this seems to be yes yeah. I mean it's uh, this kind of situations bring out the best and the worst. Hmm. And we see it in my country too, where the civil society is doing wonderful things on the one hmm. hand, but on the other hand, a lot of right-wing uh, feelings are emerging and hmm. uh, a lot of the feelings of revenge yeah. people are feeling and not enough empathy and understanding that there, <laughs> that there simply is no way of dealing and coping with the situation through violence. 
Mm. Just has to be. We have to look, and we have to do everything we can to find a kind of uh, nonviolent political solution to the problem. Mm. Because this is just a horrible cycle of violence repeating right. itself again and again and again, and it's doing and it's destroying people physically and psychologically. Yeah, I mean, there's the worry that many of the people now losing family members in Gaza might in the future turn uh, into maybe Hamas terrorists as revenge, right? Of course, and mm. you know, in this, and in, in Israel you see the revenge feelings uh, following the atrocities that Hamas mm. has committed in, in the south of Israel. So you see all these things, and uh, and uh, we just have to, uh, we have to find a different way of uh, of dealing with it, and this is possible. You can see it happened in Ireland. Mm. It happened in South Africa. I mean, Mandela, when he came out of prison, he didn't start uh, being revengeful against the, the white people and slaughtering mm. them. I mean, there are ways of dealing with these things. It's very difficult. but uh, And you need great leaders. And unfortunately, our leaders are zeros. I mean, we power hungry, manipulative mm. people who care only about the little narcissistic souls. So it doesn't, it doesn't bode well, I'm afraid. And also, I don't see great leaders in the, on the Palestinian side. Mm. I mean, the Hamas leaders are not partners, possible partners for us. But there must be possible partners among the mm. Palestinians, and I'm sure there are, and I'm sure there are in Israel. There are a lot of wonderful people in Israel, and I'm sure there are wonderful people in Palestine. So we have to somehow to come, these people have to try to find a way of uh, of talking to each other and, so, and sorting this situation. But at the moment, it's, it doesn't seem like it's likely. You know, I must say that I, I often despair. Mm. Yeah. It's hard to see how things could get better in the future. It's an ever-ending spiral of revenge. Yes, very difficult. It's possible, but mm. it's very, very difficult. Look, we Jews went through a hell of a thing in, uh, I mean, what the Germans did mm. in the during the Second World War was absolute. Absolutely horrifying, and we are in good relations with the with the Germans today. Mm. So this is possible. It is yeah. possible. So it has to be possible with the Palestinians. Hmm. Yeah, let's hope things will get better in the future. It's important to stay optimistic. Thanks so much for coming on this podcast. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you very much. It was great to hear about your research trajectory across your life um yeah thanks so much thank you um also thanks for the listeners for listening to this and yeah i wish you all a good week <laughs>